I told you it wasn't gonna be too long before I was gonna be back again with another video because I've been a busy boy. Let's get right into it because I have a number of items here and uh, I wanna make sure we get through them all. So first up, I finished this book recently, The Trials of Apollo, book five, called The Tower of Nero. In this book, uh, that it's the final book of the series, um, the god Apollo in the body of mortal Lester Papadopoulos is together with his uh, demigod kind of master Meg McCaffrey and they're on the train uh, from Washington uh, to New York where, where Nero's tower is located and but on the train ride they uh, Lester starts to see some suspicious stuff and then this uh, uh, this large gull named uh, Lou interferes and takes them captive and she's got a couple of Germani uh, guards with her um, but she engineers it so that the two of them get away and uh, Lester learns during this process that Lou is actually uh, works for Nero and was Meg's kind of guardian or tutor or mentor as she was growing up so although Lou works for Nero she's actually loyal to Meg and she wants to help get Meg out of this situation and, and defeat Nero and everything so she uh, she engineers uh, a plan where it looks like Lou is trying to capture Meg and Lester, but they defeat her and throw her off a roof, rooftop in New York, and, uh, and and she limps back to Nero, saying, "Oh, I almost had her, but uh, whatever." So she can get back into Nero's good graces, and then have um, Meg and and uh, Lester actually. Uh, submit themselves to Nero as captives so that he won't burn the city down and once they all meet up within Nero's tower they're going to then attack his magical I forget what they're called but it's basically like an essence of of the the emperor that uh, once they attack this object and destroy it he'll actually become vulnerable to attack so there's all these working parts to the plan um, they go to Camp Half-Blood to get some some uh, guidance and rest and and, and stock up and, and get the, all, all the other demigods kind of in on their plan and they stop by Percy Jackson's house get refueled uh, with his mom and his stepdad giving them food and stuff and uh, and eventually the plan is that well Lester and Meg uh, give themselves to Nero and become captive uh, Will and Nico are gonna lead a team of what were they called um, these little creatures that live under the earth and they're super good diggers and stuff I forget what they're called troglodytes that's it they're going to dig under Nero's tower and basically defuse all the um, Greek fire that he's going to unleash on the city and basically defuse his his attack plan without Nero even noticing. So then it all the story and the series all culminates inside of Nero's tower as all these different parts of the plan uh, come to bear and uh, and you'll just have to read it to see how it all works out if Lester can defeat Nero and regain his godliness and uh, and even if he does so if he even wants it anymore sort of thing so next up a Dollarama purchase dead ant the movie <laughs> it's one of those ones like Sharknado that's just kind of a like a horror movie that's kind of cheesy you know so basically it follows this um, this 80s glam band called Sonic Grave who have lost their mojo and are trying to get back into it their manager Danny gets them a gig at Coachella, which actually isn't Coachella, it's a much smaller festival, and uh, so they're on their way in their in their van, in their trailer, uh, or their pickup truck in their trailer to this show, uh, but they want to stop in Joshua Tree, uh, California, I believe, um, and meet up with this uh, Native American guy who sells this crazy-ass peyote, and they want to have a big trip together before they get to the festival, and maybe write an awesome song they can unleash at this festival, but... They are warned by the Native American who sells them the peyote that uh, when, you're, when you're out there in the middle of the desert, treat nature with respect. Do not harm a thing. And of course, being a band, <laughs> they harm a few things. And all of a sudden, there's these large ants that start attacking them. And each time they kill an ant, the ants retreat, and they come back bigger, and so on and so forth. And uh, so then it's just basically this quest for survival for this band. And, uh, and in the end, they, they travel to this festival and all the ants follow them and they start attacking all the uh, concert goers and basically to save the day, they have to rock their way out of trouble. Ah! All right, so it's, it's a cheesy horror flick, but it's awesome. It's got uh, Tom Arnold, Jake Busey, 
um, oh, what's his name? Sean Astin, one of the, the, the hobbits from the Shire. And uh, yeah, it was just a really fun, crazy type of movie. My, my type of movie. Next up, a double shot of The Thing. This two disc collection contains the original from 1982 and the prequel that came out in 2011. So we'll start with the original because it came first. It's 1982, it's Antarctica, it's an American research station and all of a sudden they notice this uh, husky running towards their camp and a Norwegian helicopter is following this husky and shooting at it and the Americans are like what the hell is happening? Finally the dog makes it to their camp, they take it in, helicopter lands, uh, the pilot accidentally blows it up but the one guy escapes and starts taking shots at, at the dog in their camp so then the captain of the research station shoots this guy dead because what else are you going to do and uh and they're like what the hell was that all about so they take the dog in everybody's like okay we got to go see what the hell is going on at the norwegian camp so they take off there they find it just obliterated and uh as events unfold and the evidence kind of mounts on on what's going on um <clears throat> they eventually find that there is an alien ship buried out in the ice and that this Norwegian team excavated um, an alien life form from nearby the crash site and uh, during this the dog that they took in actually reveals itself as an alien and uh, after they do an autopsy on a body they find at the, cra at, at the Norwegian site which has like two heads and stuff so the confusion is mounting and then this dog finally reveals it's got an alien inside of it and uh, once they kill it and burn it they do an autopsy on it and they're like this thing assimilates whatever the host organism it, it takes so it basically can reproduce itself into that person so now they're like well how the hell do we know who is who here right so uh the main character in this film is kurt russell who is rj the american uh, pilot and he basically ends up having to take control takes guys captive figures out a way to um, take blood samples from everybody and then put like a burning thing in it that the organism will react to within the blood so he's able to kind of whittle down who's safe and who's not and whatever and it just turns into this big you know fight for survival well at the same time they don't want to let an alien loose out of the camp so that it can be let loose on the world and basically take over right and and how it ends is that uh, well I won't tell you how it ends but it doesn't end the greatest <laughs> Um, as alien destruction movies usually don't. So in uh, the prequel in 2011 stars, um, what's her name? Uh, oh, I forget. She played Ramona Flowers in Scott Pilgrim. I really like Mary Elizabeth Winston. That's it. Um, she's like the main character. She's this uh, uh, American... Um, researcher named Kate Lloyd who specializes in, in kind of um, digging things out of the ice and, and stuff like that so this guy uh, this professor uh, gets his assistant uh, Adam I think his name and who name is who knows Kate to approach her and be like we found something up in Antarctica you got to come see this she's like what is it and Adam's like he won't tell me anymore but it's big it's big so she agrees to go and uh, that's when <clears throat> once they get up there he reveals to her the, what they found and they go to this site and they go under the ice and they find this big flying saucer alien ship and then they show her nearby frozen in the ice an organism that came from it so they unearth it from the ice on her guidance get it back to the camp they're all celebrating and uh during the celebrations like it's inside it starts to melt a bit and one of the guys goes to look at it and just be kind of amazed by the fact that they found an alien when it bursts loose and then it's basically the same thing as what happened in the first thing that you got this organism loose in this camp and uh it starts taking over people and eventually the Kate and figures out that it can assimilate and she finds a different way to kind of tell who may be infected and who isn't and again it's this fight for survival um, but also containment um, and then eventually it leads right up to that first scene in the original thing when the dogs taken off on the tundra and and they're the helicopter is fired up to go chase it so pretty cool that you get a prequel all those years later that leads right into that first movie because the first thing is just i mean the prequel is awesome too but the first thing as a kid i remember watching it and it scared the shit out of me <laughs> so very awesome next up 
Power Rangers Light Speed Rescue. I finally finished this season of Power Rangers. Um, it's about 40 episodes long, a uh, five disc collection. And in this series, it's kind of the first one that kind of diverts from the original Power Rangers story, I think, where it kind of completely cuts ties with, well, not completely, but it, it starts its own new story. So th the scene is Mariner Bay, a fictional uh, city in, in California. And uh, out in the desert somewhere, some explorers uh, uncover these tombs and let these demons loose and uh, they swear vengeance on on Mariner Bay because it was built over a demon burial ground that these guys are associated with and so all of a sudden all these monsters are set loose on, on Mariner Bay and uh, Captain Mitchell um, decides to put together a team of Power Rangers and he draws them all from different areas of life like you got Chad who is like a, an underwater guy animal trainer that sort of thing lifeguard you got Carter, the Red Ranger, the leader, who is a fireman. Uh, Captain Mitchell's daughter, Dana, is like a paramedic and a medical uh, medical studies kind of girl. Kelsey is an extreme sports athlete. And then, um, oh, I always forget his name, the Green Ranger. It's either Daryl. It starts with a D. And he was like a, a stunt pilot sort of thing. So these five rangers, Joel, that's his name. These five rangers come together in the underwater aqua base in Mariner Bay where they're kind of operate out of. And uh, along with Captain Mitchell, Mrs. Fairweather or Miss Fairweather is kind of their engineer that comes up with all their gear and stuff like that. So then it's just the typical Power Rangers formula. Um, monsters are sent to destroy Mariner Bay. Rangers fight them off. Along the way, you got some other plot lines. You got... Uh, um, Dana's brother, uh, Captain Mitchell's son, who uh, was assumed assumed to be lost many, many years ago when he was a kid during a car crash that they were in. Uh, he comes back to the fray and it eventually becomes the Titanium Ranger. And then also uh, Queen Banshira is the ultimate evil in this uh, series. And they're trying to bring her back to full power. So throughout the series that there's that kind of plot line going on and, and lots of deceit within the enemy ranks that kind of prevent it from happening and then accelerate it and yada yada and uh, there's also an appearance by the G Galaxy Rangers from uh, the previous series Lost Galaxy they they show up for a bit as does their mortal enemy Trakina so and in the end yeah it's uh, typical of the Power Rangers series it's either a two or three parter that kind of closes off the events and, and ties up the series and uh and there's another season of power rangers in the books another good one not my favorite but uh still fun a fun watch next up finished a bunch of games star wars squadrons this one starts off with kind of a uh a brief little scene from just after the destruction of alderaan and the first death star and stuff when vader and the empire send people after refugees from alderaan and just to wipe them out and uh Captain Lyndon Javes, who works for the Empire, kind of turn switches sides after being ordered to destroy a bunch of helpless refugees, and uh, <clears throat> and foils the Empire's plans, and then defects to the Rebel Alliance. Then it shifts forward in time to not long after the Battle of Endor, um, when he's working for the Rebel Alliance and is fully ingrained in their leadership now, and uh, Captain or Lieutenant or whatever Teresa Carroll on the Empire side who used to work with Lyndon Javes has this full-on vendetta against him and his defection so then you have um, Teresa Carroll on the Empire side and her Titan squadron versus Lyndon Javes on the Rebellion side or New Republic now I guess and his Vanguard squadron and basically you have this storyline where you don't play a known character you play kind of just a generic character and you bounce back from playing on each faction and, and doing these different missions as um, the Rebellion try and develop this Starhawk ship that is super powerful and while the Empire tries to destroy it and in the process take out Lyndon Javes and uh, it just unfolds over maybe 14 or 15 missions the storyline and uh, it's just like it's kind of like um, Rogue Squadron it's all vehicle uh, starship based uh, that's how the, the the game works and in between you can talk to people in the hangar and then go to your mission debrief and get the mission details and stuff and you can choose different ships along the way sometimes on different missions you can take either a tie interceptor or bomber or the regular tie and same thing with the rebellion or the new republic a wing y wing x wing sort of thing so fun game um, i had to play it on easy mode though because uh, i ran into a couple missions about halfway through the game or later in the game that were just monsters so i have no shame in that next up Zombieland Double Tap Road Trip for the Switch. 
This game just basically details the events between the first Zombieland movie and the second Zombieland movie. Um, the first Zombieland ended at the Pacific Playland when they had the big fight in the uh, theme park. The second Zombieland movie begins when they're living in the White House. So this details their trip across the country. You just stop in a bunch of states and, and do these missions. It's kind of a top-down view. And uh, you can play up to four players. It's all on one screen, so you just walk around. Um, kind of like a Contra overhead level sort of thing. And uh, there's different weapons you can obtain along the way. You always have your pistol, which never runs out of ammo, but you can get things like baseball bats and axes, shotguns, AK-47s. And you basically just have to face hordes of zombies as you make your way through each level towards your objective. And there's, um, uh, you get... Um, upgrade points after each level that you can spend on different aspects of your character like your movement speed, your ammo capacity, your damage done, your health, uh, and your special move, um, uh, how soon you can earn your special move. So um, really fun game, really simple, but I like those kind of just shoot them up overhead views, keep it simple, you know. Um, I don't think that the game was received very well, but, uh, and, and it's nothing groundbreaking, but uh, for what it is, um, I quite enjoyed it. I like those types of games. I don't need to be blown away with in-depth story with all these cutscenes and how your half the game is just watching a damn movie, or um, super in-depth storyline, or amazing graphics, or the fact that the game lasts, you know, it takes you half a year to complete. I don't mind a simple, basic game that doesn't take long to complete. You know, those sorts of adventures, as long as they're fun. What else do you want, right? Like fun is the key ingredient. And Zombieland is fun. So it's kind of like the Ghostbusters game that everybody ripped apart a while back. I quite enjoyed it. Repetitive, but who gives a care? Repetition's good. Next up, Critical Depth for the PS1. I found this game used at Game Cycle and I thought, oh my god, it looks just like Twisted Metal, but underwater. And it is, but it's not as well executed. Uh, I kind of beat it on easy mode and then went up to medium mode to get a couple extra levels at the end, but I gave up halfway through because... The controls aren't great. Sometimes you get stuck on stuff and you can't get your ship off. It takes forever and you're getting hammered in the meantime. Um, it's really hard to track guys down sometimes and, and, and get some shots on them, especially with your regular weapon. It just, for the amount of effort and frustration I put into it, I just had to put it away. Um, after It was fine to play on easy mode. It was fine. But once I bumped up to medium where, you know, you're putting in so much effort, but you're just getting destroyed so easily, like it just didn't seem like a good thing to continue with uh, for my you know blood pressure and stuff so um, the story behind it is that there's been these alien orbs that have surfaced in the in the earth's uh, oceans and all these different companies are after them for the different powers they might contain and so you've got I think 12 different factions each with its own unique kind of submarine and you just go and battle and try and obtain these pods and then escape through the alien gate before anybody else can so I found it was just easy to destroy everybody, get, get one of the pods so nobody can get all of them, and then just destroy everybody and then take all the pods out uh, nice and easy rather than try and collect them all with everybody still in, in the level. Sometimes that would happen, but I just found super easy just to destroy everybody first and then go about pods at your leisure, you know? Um, could have been a lot better. Cool idea, bad execution, too bad. Last up, Frogger, Ancient Shadow. Released for the GameCube, uh, uh, it was developed by Hudson Soft, I think, but released by Konami, and it's a really excellent game. Um, a really more in-depth kind of frogger, not just the one screen, hop across the road, and then you go. It's uh, more like a regular, modern type of video game, and the, the story is there's been this shady character witnessed in, the, in Firefly Swamp, and uh, the animals are starting to act all weird, and there's some sort of evil that's been unleashed. So Frogger takes it upon himself to, I'll go find out what it is. Just this little frog, right? So you're tasked with going through these different levels. Each level has four different, or each world or section of the map has four different levels. Uh, the fourth level always being a boss of some sort. And uh, you basically have, uh, the controls are, are neat, but hard to get used to. Like the R and L buttons on the top basically spin frogger in place either whichever way you're doing it um a is to jump which moves you two squares and uh, can jump over like an open space uh your movement button just moves you one space in either direction uh, or any direction and uh and then you can also press y to jump straight up in the air 
and uh, you can press B to stick out your tongue, which you can grab onto things and swing, or um, attach it to platforms and then move them around sort of thing. So the game is half action, and then half like puzzle solving ability to like, oh, I gotta move these blocks around to get over here. How do I do that? What's the order, you know, sort of thing. So it's kind of a thinker and a and an action game at the same time and a really well-developed game. Everything about this game was amazing except how hard it is. I didn't finish it. <laughs> I got to the, I thought it was on the last world of the game and I finally beat the last two levels the other night. And then it was like, oh, it's still going. You're inside this volcano now. And the first level is amazingly hard. And it's like, I got three more of these after this, if I can get this one beaten, I'm like, nope, I'm done. Again, the blood pressure. So it was just like, it got to the point where there was the like these two platforms that I had to jump across and they're moving like, like super fast and, and not always in the same spot. They would move up and down so they're far apart and then when they get closer together, it was like, and if you miss and you fall into the lava, you have to restart at the start of the whole level again, which is a pain in the ass just to get where I was. So I was like, you know what? I'm not a 12 year old kid anymore who has all the time in the world to basically do nothing. Um, so this game be going away. So, but that's it. Lots of stuff done. Um, lots of enjoyable stuff. Only one miss with critical depth maybe, but everything else was amazing. And uh, I will get working on the next, ba next, next batch ASAP. Peace.